It's August the 24th, 2024. I'm Chris, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. A wonderful day to California. Hello. Hi, Jeremiah. Hey. <laughs> <How are> you? <laughs> From very, very moderately um, summery in California to a blasting furnace in Germany. Exactly. The, the well-tempered uh, California. The the yeah. We're we're in the nineties, which means above thirty Celsius. So, anyway, yeah. we, we have to deal with that. And uh, I know air conditioning, but, film. <laughs> but I do have I do have film. my trusty my trusty fan blowing well, well, on nice. my belly, which is nice. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Adrian um, is out today. We wanted to talk about a piece of tech, but then not just about a piece of tech, but but what that tech actually means and. Uh, so, um, Halide, you have used Halide in the past. I have used it. It's a photo app. The the guys behind Halide, um, oh, it's, and it's iOS only. Um, the guys behind Halide are, um, how would you describe them? Very, Mac very freaks. Freaks, yeah, but very deep in the weeds when it comes to um, making camera software and uh, and the image processing behind it and they've they've implemented their own processing algorithms um beyond what other things do they have their own secret sauce and um and they've just released a new feature in halide that is uh no processing whatsoever if i understand it correctly that's right and and a part of our general conversation will be shooting on how you shoot raw, unprocessed, and uh, the focus yeah. between processing in camera and processing after. Um, mm -hmm. we, it could be on iOS as well, the processing, but generally yeah, on a computer. So, so the, 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 the reason to the dark room. Yeah, the reason this is interesting, and, and by the way, Halite is a paid app. It's, uh, it's either, either, I think you can pay a, a lump sum and then you have it um, for life or for at least the next couple of versions or you pay a monthly fee um, I think it's under 20 bucks a year or something anyway so um, um, they, they call their new feature process zero and it does it does a few interesting things as opposed to other low process kind of things if you look at uh, a, a photo you just take a plain old photo with your apple iphone and then look at it and zoom in and you will often get to notice the processing on the photo it's like i don't know some people call it a watercolor effect um where things are th 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 things things are things are sharpened and then they are denoised and things get pictures get um, quite, yeah, <laughs> quite weird <laughs> sometimes. Well, they, 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 they assume a look uh, that has been applied um, it, by those who wrote the software. But it's In a bit more, words, it's more than just a look. The, I think the look comes, um, well, the look is, is of course important, but it comes from what they do with the pictures. Because if you take a regular picture with your iPhone, it takes 10 pictures. It takes a few pictures. It starts shooting before you even press the shutter button, and you press the shutter button, and then there's another five pictures taken, and then those are somehow magically, um, machine learningly uh, composed together and and sharpened, and the best the best ones are used for the sharpness and for the colors, and then there's some some magic. There's a lot of magic going on, which means that anyone can pick up a camera. Uh, a smartphone and take a picture and you won't really have to know a lot about what taking a photo actually means what it does because the camera does so much for you and then there, that results in look and one of these results is um, what's called HDR processing so if you take a picture with a phone in a room 
it is you 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 now have the expectation that everything has detail the inside the outside there could be bright sunlight outside the window and there could be just a dimly lit room inside and you'd still have detail in both so um there, there's a lot of magic happening um, but most people nowadays would consider that normal right that's right and and uh, also you know th this is your know, parenthetical uh, to this is when people say um oh you know there's much too much ai in this world in terms of image creation or image um, editing, etc., etc. The pictures we take on a phone with a very small lens and chip, relatively, and create pretty effective large files that can be blown up and and and, and kind of sharpened. And um, we are using AI to do that. And and the I think the purpose of the Halide app, uh, among others, but is to take a picture with no processing. So if you've looked at a picture that you've taken in, say, a relatively balanced lighting condition, not, not super um, contrasty, uh, and you, you, know, you can notice um, what appears to be some red halation, some grain, some, you can call it noise grain, um, it, it has it, it, its own, quote, look. Um, and then you can then apply a look to that or adjust it um, and use all the information from that picture to address the look that you desire. And what's interesting about the app, at least in my experience shooting it, is that it allows uh, the photographer to control the final um, look and feel of the piece rather than the camera. Um, and that can be uh, very um, ar artistically liberating, shall I say. Um, not unlike taking a picture, going to the darkroom, developing a negative, and then printing it, burning, dodging, uh, focusing in terms of look, color, um, or contrast. It's a pretty uh, film-like experience. And uh, okay, so so let's 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 try to get the text the, the tech out of the way first, because um, in essence, what Halite does here is they give you a raw file, which means the rawest possible file that you can get with an iPhone. There's an API inside the operating system, so the Halite app asks the iPhone, give me the rawest possible file, and that's it, pretty much. Um, it says, stay out of my way. Stay out of my way. Don't <laughs> mess with the picture. Don't do AI stuff. Don't do machine learning stuff. Don't combine pictures. Don't extend the dynamic range by combining several pictures don't mess with the colors and don't mess with the noise and then don't mess with the noise uh, <clears throat> and then they give you a raw file and that is different from what canon calls their pro raw because that is a uh, a raw format that has apple secret sauce built in so you will get some form of stuff happening to the picture so um halite does not do that and you see this in the picture when you take a picture with Halite, you will uh, you will not get all the processing, and that will result in pictures that are th th that have a, a different dynamic profile, a different expression of the darks and the brights. Um, if you zoom in into one of these pictures, you will probably see some noise in there, um, which again, normally you never get to see that because the AI takes that out. So. And Chris, also, I, I think people um, can learn a lot about photography in general by taking a picture with this particular approach and really studying the image and seeing things in the image that, A, you might have taken for granted before, like the color of the sky or the contrast or even the color itself, certainly the noise, 
and, and, and learn about what you would like to see in that particular image. And then you can apply a certain personal look to it. And that's um, the thing. The, 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 the raw file gives you a lot of, um, a lot of possibility to play with the picture, to modify it. But you will have to do this. It's, it's kind of almost a must to do something with the picture. Um, because the pictures that come out of this are less contrasty than what you're used to. They are yeah, less, they're flatter. They're less colorful. But also, they do tend to have more detail. If you, if you zoom in, um, a lot of the very fine detail in some pictures with the regular process just gets flattened by, by the noise reduction. And in this case, that does not happen. So you have this interesting um, file that has, has its very own aesthetic, right? Now it's let's ju jump, jump for me, if you will. When you take a picture with your uh, Canon, whatever you're using today, or generally, uh, I would assume when you're out in the field and you have your settings, um, you have choices. In other words, you can shoot this, depending on what your output um, intention is, to shoot in JPEG, even a very kind of small file JPEG, or a large file JPEG, or a JPEG and a DNG, uh, which is sort of a, a, an Adobe application of a general, what a they would file. call a raw file, um, or, or both. Um, I tend, when I go out and shoot, that I will, for fun, set it on JPEG and RAW. And depending on my mood and, and what I feel like, I will create a look, uh, whether it's in the camera or post, for my JPEGs. Um, especially on a phone or in, you know, on my Leica. So that... After I press the shutter button, I will see a, uh, an image that approximates what it is I'd like to see in the final output. And yet, I'm not baking that into the file because I have the raw file that I can take into my computer and emulate what I see in the JPEG, output it as a TIFF, output it as a PNG, or re-output it as a large file JPEG with the aesthetic that I liked initially when I shot it and had a reference or not, or change it completely. Uh, sometimes we're in the black and white mood. And yet when we come home, we go, you know, I, I'm into color now. <laughs> so you're not, you're not basically baking uh, an image uh, so that you never are able to reprocess it in a way that, that, that allows you the creative energy to do that. And, and that is the beauty of shooting RAW or shooting with RAW and JPEG together. So this is an app that allows that, I would say, more... I don't want to say professional because a lot of professionals will just shoot in JPEG, um, but but a more creative control um, that we're used to in in mirrorless or DSLRs um, that we can celebrate in our iPhones, and that that's a little bit of an advance. It, it is. It is an advance. It's also uh, interesting because it kind of forces you into a specific way of working. Um, whereas with all the all the automatic features, you don't really have to think about what 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 you want to do. You just point the camera. You frame the shot. You choose the moment. You press the shutter button, and um, and uh, out, out it comes. <laughs> and out it comes, and it typically looks fairly good and uh, in this case here you uh, you have to for example think about the light you do not have a night mode or anything in that it's just it will struggle in low light it's just a fact it because because your because your smartphone will in low light just switch to the night mode and it will take longer exposures and it will change things and it will uh, combine several pictures into one um, this one doesn't do that it just takes the picture and low light will 
look different. It will be harder for it to get a good picture in low light unless what you want is something that looks like that or unless you want something that, I don't know, t leaves everything in the black and just and just exposes perfectly for that light source in the corner there. Now, here's a question for you. Um, have you used the Lightroom app um, camera? Um, just, just brushed it. Really haven't looked into it in detail. Because I, I, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to get over my skis in terms of what that is, but I, I recall, because I use it infrequently, but sometimes, in creating, um, because obviously I think there's a setting where you can actually shoot in DNG. And, um, it's true, yeah. And, and then process it later. So this, this isn't the really the, the first of its kind. There's uh, several, and we can talk about those later in terms of shooting raw, but also some of them will shoot the equivalent of, of their own personal, like Canon um, does, um, a ProRes, you know, if we're talking about video, um, a, a sort of personalized, lighter processing that allows more manipulation. Um, I, I guess what we are looking for when we take a photograph um, on film is we're looking for the broadest dynamic range possible to cover as much information as possible and overall the sharpest. So that afterwards, when we go into the dark room and process it, so that it it allows all of that information to um, to reveal itself, when we start to make prints, we then have the opportunity uh, to create something that is very personal, whether it's a gray aesthetic, whether it's a contrasty aesthetic, whether it's, um, you know, a, a muted color, whether it's, you know, a brighter color, all of those things are possible in post. We tend to forget about that. Um, we've gotten away from that with digital photography, um, certainly combining camera and Photoshop. We've been doing this for, you know, 25 years. But on the iPhone, which is really designed more for snapshot work. I mean, that's the inception of it. Is, yeah, it, it used started. to be that way. I would, I would argue not it's anymore. not any longer. No, no not anymore. The more people have an iPhone in their pocket and are using it for much more than snapshots. Yeah, and professionals create. use the iPhone now yes. very often. Yeah, and, and, and for video as well. Um, so uh, I see these kind of advances in these apps as being a real step forward in um, giving the photographer more control over their final intention. Um, and that's a good thing. And I, I hope that more apps, more photo apps will start to do this in ways that allow of the processing um, to be a separate step from the capture. Also, interestingly enough, um, and you and I, we both ca come from film. We both know what it feels like to shoot in film. We both know where the shortcomings are and where the advantages are. And for a long time, um, the, the digital photography has not felt like film because it is so advanced, because it does so much for you. And, uh, and as much as that's a wonderful thing because it lets you get the shot when you need to, um, going to Halide in, in the smartphone and switching on that feature, that felt instantly felt like this old pair of sneakers that feels so good because you've been walking in it for years and you know it's a, it, it's a it's a fit and it brought back memories from a time that was different in photography so there is a a, a nostalgia component in there as well um, but also the aesthetic is a different one it is clearly a different one and uh um, and by the way, yes, there are other apps that, that will give you raw files. Um, but the fact that I'm using Halide anyway, um, it was kind of a no-brainer to then use well, also, it in Halide. 
also with with uh, other apps, and I, I've chosen one as a pick. Um, others, um, the one goes into the settings and and selects whether or not one wants to use JPEG, DNG, raw file, etc. With Halo, but but you have to kind of um, know what that is going in. Halide, um, I think, puts it right out front so that it says zero processing. And I think just naming it that way, for people who don't know, for people who aren't experienced in digital negatives or raw files and post-processing, they will ask themselves, zero processing? What Oh, does that mean that if I don't click it, I have processing? So it makes them question the kind of processing and looks uh, that are applied to their image through the app and then question that viability um, of their own intention in terms of look. That's a good uh, movement forward for photographers or aspiring professionals or a way to learn when you can question what is that relationship you have with the machine and what you're doing with the machine. Um, and, and so the fact that they are pushing it out front, zero processing, really does um, make us question, and here it is, a kind of classic uh, approach to photography. Like when we shoot film, we're not asked, do you want to apply a look to this? Um, you know, you're shooting a negative. There's no, there's no difference outside of lens quality and, and if, if everything is the same between shooting with a Holga at, you know, a 60th at f8 or a you know, a Canon at 60th and F8 or a Leica at 60th and F8 um, on, say, Triax. It, it is what it is. You're going to get differences in sharpness because of your lens, uh, maybe a more accurate shutter speed within, you know, milliseconds. But the negative will tend to look overall the same. Um, not so with digital cameras. It, it also forces you into being a bit more deliberate with your choices. Because you, yeah. now you have to make choices. And one is the exposure, for example. Um, here in, in the video, you can see an example um, where uh, the, the indoor-outdoor scene, you have a window, there's something outside, you have an inside uh, and you take a picture. And um, now you, your choice is, do I want the inside to be well exposed or do I want the outside to be well exposed? Because you can't really have both with the, the, the dynamic range, the dynamic range that the sensor in the iPhone has, because it's not, it's the, the, the white dynamic range. If, if we look at the HDR photos, here's the example with the indoors and outdoors being well exposed at the same time. That is a composite of multiple pictures at different exposures. So um, H HDR, that, that's, that's what we call it. That's HDR. what the phone does for you. Um, but if you, if you shoot with that kind of a tool, then you have to be deliberate at what you want. So you have to think about, you have to, um, what, what I like to tell, what, what I like to call, you have to put the process, you have to make the decisions at the beginning of the process and not at the end of the process. Where, yeah, with many when we, yeah, when we shoot film, we we ascribe what we would call or consider gamma, um, and and if, if we say here's our exposure range between say the bright and the dark, now we can often adjust that gamma to the dark. So it will pull more stuff out of the dark and less out of the out of the bright, or adjust the gamma the other way. Um, but it will remain, um, let's say, ten stop range, and maybe our image is a fourteen stop range of brightness to to, to darkness. And we make a decision. This is with with. Um, very expensive cameras and highly sensitive sensors that the gamma is expanded. So there's more information in the file or the negative 
um, regional negative that allows for us, say, to capture more contrast um, or more dynamic range. Um, smaller sensors, cheaper, um, will reduce that gamma. And so they have to make that up artificially. And gamma adjustment is really what we're, we're kind of talking about that. One does it artificially, one does it um, with processing. Uh, the other really is, is a fixed form of it. And I wonder what the gamma of an iPhone is in terms of stops. Do you know? I don't. I would say six, seven stops, maybe. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't give it more. Um, whereas, whereas a, 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 I don't know, a Canon R one something will have thirteen, fourteen, fifteen stops. Yeah. So, in exactly. one shot, and that is, and that is not a, and and that is not a uh, constructed dynamic range that you get with the iPhone by combining multiple shots. But no, it's the um, real it's deal. It, it really, what does it capture when we shoot <clears throat> with, um, you know, high quality cinema digital and cameras? Don't get me wrong. Uh, a, a smaller dynamic range doesn't mean worse. The photos are worse. No. Rather the opposite. In some cases that will give you that interesting bit in a photo. Let's say you shoot a scene where something dips into black in a shadow somewhere that will not just uh, be a, a part of the picture that's missing it will also be a part of the picture where you as the viewer can put in your imagination where you are are asked by the photo to imagine what's going on in the in the dark and that makes the photo yeah. more interesting also the uh, you know the other way is you may want to blow out the window or you want to you may want to shoot into the sun and have all of that information just just be very dreamlike in terms of um, the the kind of effect that the light has on the lens that's a look that's interesting yeah. um, and and that sometimes is very very hard to apply on a high dynamic range because you won't be able to flare things so easily because remember when you're shooting in a small dynamic range into light and you get basically burnout or whatnot, there is nothing, there is no information yeah. in the highlights. There's nothing to recover there. Um, but if you're shooting in sort of uh, what we would call today uh, HDR mo mode, um, you will shoot an image or your, imi your capture mechanism, iPhone in this case, will capture a, a, it'll close down the shut. It'll speed up the shutter or close down the iris to take a, uh, a, a well captured picture in the highlights. Uh, it'll lift the shadows. It'll combine them, and then you will have something that appears to be normal, but uh, it is something that's happening inside the the machine. Also, you're saying appears to be normal. It only appears to be normal because our the, the way our senses are conditioned, um, consider it normal because that's what we've been seeing for so long. Um, if you look at photography from the 1970s, that looks different from the photography today in terms of style, in terms of colors, in terms of uh, sharpness and so on. And back then that was normal and now it looks like vintage. So the, 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 what we perceive as being normal changes all the time so now it's the aesthetic of smartphones um but maybe maybe we'll get some of that film-like aesthetic back into digital this way i think that would be cool i i think if we're applying this to what we consider where we're going future of photography we will be able to see better captures in what we would consider raw files in other words expanding i think there will be a lot of uh, work in um, evolving chips that increase the dynamic range of an iPhone or yep. similar and and therefore give us more control over our digital negative, DNG, um, and then more control over our post-processing, even within the machine itself. Um, and I think that's where we're going. And I think we see 
the evolution beginning here, um, maybe more overtly, it's been happening, but more overtly in the halide who are celebrating this. They're, they're pushing this as a feature, not a bug. <laughs> this is a feature that you can have zero. In other words, they're saying, hey, use our app. There's less. <laughs> I, I find that very interesting. In other words, they're not trying to go use our our um, our app because you can emulate, you know, uh, a thousand film looks. Um, it's not V, you know, what is it, uh, VBO, whatever the filtering used to be a ah. an app that apply, you know, some terrible app that what applied. What's the name of that? Yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. I want to say VRBO, but that, that's a rental. That's not something place. different. So, <laughs> right. so but, it's re it's reduction to the max, pretty much. Yeah. Well, we might we might end up with some technology sooner or later. That, well, there is technology already. Have you? You've, let me let me bring this up just as a little uh, sidebar here. Um, have you ever seen the modulo ca camera? No, you no. haven't. <laughs> So um, it's a technology that it's been around for a few years. MIT has been playing with it and it's a sensor or a, a camera technology that will give you infinite dynamic range. And the way they do it is um, if you look at the individual pixels, an overexposure means the pixel is full, full of electrons, right? Um, what they do is they have a timer running and they wait until it's full and then they empty it and wait until it's full again and empty it and so on. In or And then they count how often this thing has been filled and they mathematically create the dynamics of the photo out of that. So it collects as much light as you want because it keeps going and going and going and the counter keeps go uh, going and going up. And in the end... Um, they make it into a photo and th it's not out of the question that this might at one time end up in our cameras and then dynamic range is just not a thing anymore. Well, while this seems very, very good for astrophotography, it's uh, less good for street photography. <laughs> well, it, it depends on what kind of a kind of a, how, how it's implemented. You know, it's always an implementation detail here. Yeah. All right. Um, so, um, yeah, play with RAW on your phone. and all, all good. And I, you know, I'd say this, uh, certainly my work has been, you know, for the last uh, few years, uh, you know, focused on AI, etc. cetera. But, um, you know, this week I happened to spend the week in Big Sur and, um, you know, Beautiful. took my can took my cameras with me or my my iPhone and my Leica, that's it, and shot a lot of pictures um, and experimented with uh, the raw um, application of kind of creating a look afterwards, always shooting with uh, DNG um, raw, and we'll process those later uh, this week and print them. Um, but I had a lot of a lot of fun with experimenting with different applied looks, um, both from the iPhone and uh, and the camera, and posted a few on our um, shared uh, photo website. All right, link, um, link so, is of course in the show notes. Yeah, and you, so you can see, um, you know, the, the the differences, and I applied looks to some, whether they be black and white, whether they be um, color, uh, film emulation, some very specific film, you know, Lomo, <laughs> Lomo film emulation with grain. And, and th there, you know, it, it really is a, um, such an amazing choice we have on, um, you know, and you see there, there's tremendous differences here. Um, of, you know, processing um, straight out, lo you know, low, low look, you know, just all manner of photos that, again, capture the feel and look of Big Sur. Um, 
in a painterly quality, here's one that I just call color, no color. Um, you know, and that's pretty straight, very little processing. This has a lot of processing. Um, and, and just kind of rediscover um, a sense of what happens between the moment of capture and what you apply to it, because they're very different. And um, a lot of these images I can process in, you know, hundreds of ways. So, so the next, the next, uh, well, let's, let's move on to the pics. And I brought us a photo, which made the rounds in the, in the social media a good week ago. Um, and of course, it's August. It's the time of the, the per Perseids. Is that what, what you call them? The Perseids? Meteor, um, mer a, mer meteor shower. A meteor shower that comes along once a year and mid-August is the peak of it where you get a, I don't even know, a hundred uh, meteors an hour or something. So um, that is a great photo op. And um, there's a photographer called Josh Dury who took a picture and I... I guess there is a bit of processing in this one because, um, well, let's just look at it. So um, I'll I'll go through it from the top to the bottom. We we see a night sky, we see um, meteors, and many of them, and it's a it's a bit of a bent picture. So there's some some distortion in there from the lens. Um, we see the Milky Way, and some of these meteors have a interesting kind of bright spot or several bright spots it's probably the way they go through the atmosphere and light up in a different way over time and then it keeps going and going and going to the horizon and there is stonehenge at the bottom so it's this combination of uh, multiple things in a photo it's um it's an interesting foreground it's an in interesting location It's an interesting subject, uh, the meteors. It's an interesting other subject, which is the Milky Way. Um, I would expect this picture to have been uh, composited from multiple shots. Because well, the dynamic range is significant here from the is. blackest of the sky to lit Stonehenge. And everything in between, <laughs> I don't. I won't even comment on what that dynamic range actually is. But um, this is probably not a picture that he snapped from no, his iPhone. No, it is. It is uh, most certainly multiple photos um, for the different brightnesses in the picture and a very masterful combination of. Of all of those, and I, yeah, it was, it was a yeah, stunning photo agent. after all. This is uh, one of the great uh, applications of HDR, I would say, because and it not, doesn't and, and not necessarily the HDR built into your camera, but an HDR created from multiple yes. exposures at, at and not multiple shouting exposure about it, levels, right? Yeah. Not no. shouting about it because um, you wouldn't go, oh, that's HDR. Like some HDR things are so overly processed, they look in a way like illustrations, cartoons, etc. This looks like, quote, a normal thing. It, it's trying to emulate what the eye sees, even though yeah. the eye, I don't think, could see this oh, as clearly or just, as it feels. Or just like. it emulates what, what you feel when, you, when yes. you're there. Yes. Yeah. All right. And what did you bring us? My pick of the week is another um, iPhone app, and it's called Perla, and it, I, I've been using it also this week, um, and uh, again, the headline says it all. Um, you can shoot in, uh, it, it feels design-wise um, that it is um, supposed to create the the way we shoot with normal cameras in other words all dials and uh, you know we can control um, as much or as little as we want we can set it to fully automatic we can make it aperture oriented or or um, shutter oriented we have a little button you know a, a wheel that kind of kind of pulls the the um, the exposure 
brighter, you know, or darker. So in, in that way, it, you know, it feels like a point, point and shoot with um, the ability to shoot more professionally. Also, it has some really interesting film emulation qualities. Um, and uh, it, it, while I wouldn't kind of rave about the controls, they're a little fiddly. Um, they are, uh, it, it creates a look that is very different from any that I have used. And it also indicates a direction um, I think I had mentioned or used as a pick uh, maybe a couple of months ago of the Leica photo app, which has its own emulations. Um, and, and we're seeing more and more of that Fuji has. I mean, it, you know, everyone's getting into this... Um, this dance of kind of creating a brand that emulates its own <laughs> looks and feels. But again, the tendency now is, is to give the, the shooter the, the control over how much or how little of these, uh, these um, kind of aesthetic choices uh, we tend to make and also control over the exposure and shutter speed of our of our phones to be able to gain more uh, or less control as we desire when we shoot. But Perla is something that I've, I've liked for certain um, shots. Yeah. It's, it's almost like, it's almost like, um, like the photographer who, who has this huge, huge photo bag with 10 different cameras in it. And, uh, loads of different lenses and uh, you, you're kind of replicating that experience on your phone with apps and different processing and different ways to to operate it and different usabilities different user experiences and uh, as we know the experience will also change the way you take pictures the camera influences the photographer and the photo that comes out so. Yeah, and, and you know, I think we both uh, agree that that it's it's best to choose one and just use that one uh, rather than going out and going, what should I use? Because it's like your dual camera bags and several <laughs> cameras around your neck. By the time you figure out what camera lens film combination you want to work with, the image has disappeared. <laughs> In many cases, you just want to be able to, like, get that image as close to the moment of influence. But, or but it's possible. still okay. fun to, to get your feelers out and try to try something new, try something different. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm just saying that, that it, it's best to focus on one, really explore it, then do it again with another app and do it again with another app. And then the choice is like on, on my phone, I have, you know, I have the camera app just on the front screen, but I also have a little folder with maybe three different of my favorite apps, you know, Halide, Perla, Leica, that are just there. So they're, instead of one button push, I have to do maybe two button push to get way. to launch those. By the way, just a little uh, a little tip, if you if you uh, use an iPhone, um, I have multiple camera apps as widgets on my on my home on my lock screen. So if oh. I want to start Halide, I can do it straight from the lock screen, um, which saves I think I should do that. which I saves I so much time. And uh, <laughs> I, it's, it's a single tap from the lock screen. <laughs> mine are all like uh, AI. <laughs> AI. Now, you, of course, you only you can only put four there, so you have to be uh, you have yes. to make a choice. But it's it's the this this change in iOS um, has been the game changer for me because now I can have the onboard camera and uh, Argentum and uh, Halite directly with one tap and. Yeah. That makes that that makes it worth uh, giving up on on one of, or two of these slots that might otherwise be filled with something else. So there we go. Um, raw, sure, raw. raw. I, raw. It's it really changes the, not just the aesthetics but the way you approach photography. So 
you don't do that, if you if if you if you've succumbed to the iPhone photography lifestyle, then it might be worth taking another look at the whole raw thing. Well, you can find us online at thefuturephotography.com. Um, join us on our Discord. Yep, let's chat photography. And uh, we'll be back in a week. Until then, until then, everyone, take care. And bye-bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.